it looks like we had uh, some technical glitch. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Things happen. So I guess I'll start sharing again. Long time. Long time. <laughs> 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 oh, where's the shot? I'm not sure if all of the kids are already here. Well, we have oh. 20 people. Uh, we uh, Last time we had 25 participants. So m most of the people are in. You, you, you may do it one more minute. So. Do I go on? <laughs> yeah, go on, go on. Uh, we're okay. recording this, so uh, those who will miss it will be able to watch it. That's fine. Okay, perfect. So, okay, we were on questions. So do you have any other questions or any other comments or ideas? If not, well, let me know in the chat. And okay, so do you remember the Drake's equation, right? That I was talking to you previously. So nowadays, um, those initial estimates that Drake uh, used maybe are not actually as accurate as we might think. So um, there are some updates on the estimates that could actually be on these variables. So let me explain it a little bit better for you. So the first one uh, variable would be how many stars are being formed every year in our galaxy. So according to NASA, it is from 1.5 to 3 stars to point to 3 stars that could be formed every year in our galaxy. Now, how many of, this, of those stars have planets? So it is considered to be 100% because actually um, stars that don't have a planet are actually the exception uh, instead of a rule. And okay, so now the average number of planets that can potentially support life per star that has planet. This is not defined because there are so many um, things to have to take into account. For example, maybe we don't need to talk only about planets. We should also consider moons and maybe we should not consider if the life is suitable, if the planet is suitable for life based on what there is in the surface, but than what it is in the subsurface, for example, if life is possible there. And we also have to take into account, for example, if gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn are needed in a planetary system so that life can actually be more suitable since you know that those gas giants are the ones that um, avoid a lot of meteorites to come here and, and for and they avoid us to be bombarded. Yeah, exactly, like asteroids. And there are some other people that just say that being optimistic that maybe in every planetary system, there is at least one rock that is 
that could harbor life. Now, the amount of planets that could support life that actually develop life at some point. So it is thought to be 100%. We don't have a certain a certainty for that since we have only been based on life on Earth and only one type of life. So in here, uh, geologically speaking, there is no like really differences on time since um, when the conditions on Earth were suitable for life to be possible and the emergence of life. So that is why it is thought that as soon as a planet or a moon uh, can have the perfect conditions for life to happen, life will happen. So that's why we have an estimate of 100%. Another one would be that the fraction of planets that have this life actually go on to develop intelligent life or well, civilizations. So there are different thoughts about this. So the first one would be that the possibilities for this to happen is just one in billions, for example. There is only one species on Earth and between billions of all species that Earth has seen that has actually developed a civilization. And so maybe the probabilities are too low. But there are some other optimistic people and say that um, the probabilities are of 100%. So it is very, they think that life, intelligent life can happen as soon as there is life. And there is another um, scientist, which is called Pascal Lee, and he actually um, took into account the time that took for intelligent life to emerge. So he had into, he took into account this, that life was um, emerged 4.6 billion of years ago, but civilizations had started with Homo erectus 1 million of years ago. So maybe the probabilities for that is of 0 0.00, 0.0002. <laughs> Now, according to Pascal Lee, also the probabilities to have a, for that civilization to develop an advanced technology so that uh, they could emit signal, signals on the universe could be of 10%. Now, the length of time for which those civilizations could release, and there are many thoughts um, Michael Shermer is a scientist that has uh, proposed uh, these years, which is 304 and 420, based on all the civilizations that we have seen, like, for example, the Roman Empire and all of those different civilizations. And he said, OK, they lasted this amount of, of years. So maybe that's the amount of years that uh, life could be emitting signals. But there are some other scientists that say that actually the length of time could be of billions since maybe intelligent life can actually know how to achieve immortality or maybe that life is um, replaced by artificial intelligence so they could be actually emitting signals for billions of years and according to Pascal Lee he just estimates He's just based on the longest civilizations on Earth that go from 3,000 to 5,000 years. So he said, okay, being optimistically, it could be of 10,000 years. So these are the current estimates on the Drake equation. And I actually uh, used, um, I actually used the minimum values of all of the current estimates and it gave me a probability that the amount of civilization that could be emitting signals in our galaxy is, is of 0 0.009, which is actually very, very low. And we see that in the initial estimates of Frank Drake, it was of 20 civilizations, the minimum. Now, now here it says 0 0.009. So maybe we are that 0 0.009 in our galaxy. In that case, 
since it is very little, we could say, okay, maybe we are alone. But uh, here comes the great part, which is that life is more than intelligent life. Life is not only extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Life is everything we can see in this slide. For example, we, we see trees, we are seeing a lake, and in those uh, places, there are different forms of life. So um, astrobiologists who actually are try to focus on forms of life that are less complex. And that is what the research on astrobiology is actually based now. So I prepared this poll. So I want to know what organisms, what organisms do you think that are less complex for humans? So I'm sending you the link. so that you can answer. Like what organisms do you think that are less complex or the lesser, com the, the more, the less complex organism on earth? What do you think it is? Like for example, I don't know, you could say, okay, I think that trees are the less complex. <laughs> Amoeba, bacteria. Protozoa, mm -hmm. cell. single cell. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that wrote viruses, that is a very interesting answer because hmm, do we consider viruses alive? Those are great um, answers. They're almost like in between, right? Yeah, I do actually believe the same. Viruses are in between. Mm -hmm. Exactly, they have the ability to reprogram our DNA, the DNA of our cells. But if they are outside in the environment, they won't be able to replicate. So that's why they are not considered like actually alive. Now, okay. Fungi, yeah, archaea, that is part of protozoa. So yeah, exactly. And now that we were talking about viruses, like actually what is, what is live then? Since we cannot define if something like a virus is live, then what is live? But we can have this discussion. We can have a break time right now. And let's have five minutes to stretch. I'm going to bring some cup of coffee. <laughs> and then I'll see you in five minutes, OK? <laughs> it's so nice that you like the pans. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> okay, let's see you.
Okay, hello. Um, so we are back. I hope you're there. I prepared this uh, other poll for the last topic that I want to talk about, which is what is life? So I want you to answer to that question. Um, let me activate the question and let's see what your answers are. Yes, actually, I have to <laughs> run a little, but the last topic is not so so um, long. What is life for you? It is what it is. <laughs> Yes, and there are no um, wrong answers. I just want you to know you can have a philosophical, a religious answer, and that is going to be okay because there are different types of definitions for life. And life is so broad. The existence of things. Mm -hmm. Munch, munch. So as we are running out of time, I want to, um, so what is life is actually a question that as I told you, um, there are different uh, definitions for that and it depends on the field that is actually defining life. So we have philosophy, for example, uh, so we could have a philosophical definition or it has been defined in synthetic biology or defined based on the origins of life. Uh, we have a definition in astrobiology and maybe there are definitions on computational artificial life. So there are debates about is actually artificial intelligence alive? And I interview a couple of people and their definition for life for them was like, okay, so life is respect each other. It's having a calm status. It's being grateful, be happy, but we are talking about science, right? So these are my two favorite definitions about um, life. And the first one would be that life is a regime that contains a hereditary program for defining and directing molecular mechanisms that actively extract matter and energy from the environment, with the aid of which matter and energy is converted into building blocks for its own maintenance and if possible, reproduction. So that answers also to a question that someone was asking about uh, the, Miller experiment like so when they are the cells are there so how they keep alive so that is why this is life is defined like this this definition was given by Fred Spear in its book Big History and the Future of Humanity and the second definition would be that life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution I also like this definition is um, short and it actually takes a lot into account because maybe someone could say, okay, it's, it's, it's not complete. So um, why are we talking about Darwinian evolution? But when we talk about Darwinian evolution, we're, having, we're taking into account mutability, heredit hereditability, and for those things to happen, this, the organisms need to self-replicate or either to reproduce. And for that, we are also needing a flux of, of high energy molecules to then give us a low energy products so that life could be self-sustained. Now, um, since we're running out of time, I wanted to ask you, 
well, you're already answering it. If you were agreeing with any of the definitions that I already gave, or what do you think it could be a better definition? Is that definition enough? So let me know in the chat. And finally, there is this very exciting video also from Kurtzgesat, which is, what is life? Life is fun. Let me change the subtitles. Share the sound. Fundamentally different from dead stuff, or is it? Physicist Erwin Schrödinger defined life this way. Living things avoid decay into disorder and equilibrium. What does this mean? Let's pretend that your download folder is the universe. It started orderly and got more and more chaotic over time. By investing energy, you can create order and clean it up. This is what living things do. But what is life? Every living thing on this planet is made of cells. Basically, a cell is a protein-based robot too small to feel or experience anything. It has the properties we just assigned to life. It has a wall that separates it from the surroundings creating order. It regulates itself and maintains a constant state. It eats stuff to stay alive. It grows and develops. It reacts to the environment. And it's subject to evolution. And it makes more of itself. But of all the stuff that makes up a cell, no part is alive. Stuff reacts chemically with other stuff, forming reactions that start other reactions which start other reactions. In a single cell every second, several million chemical reactions take place, forming a complex orchestra. A cell can build several thousand types of protein, some very simple, some complex micro-machines. Imagine driving a car at 100 km an hour while constantly rebuilding every single part of it with stuff you collect from the street. That is what cells do. But no part of the cell is alive. Everything is dead matter moved by the laws of the universe. So is life the aggregate of all these reaction processes that are taking place? Eventually, every living thing will die. The goal of the whole process is to prevent this by producing new entities. And by this, we mean DNA. Life is, in a way, just a lot of stuff that carries genetic information around. Every living thing is subject to evolution, and the DNA that develops the best living thing around it will stay in the game. So, is DNA life then? If you take DNA out of its hull, it certainly is a very complex molecule, but it can't do anything by itself. This is where viruses make everything more complicated. They are basically strings of RNA or DNA in a small hull and need cells to do something. We're not sure if they count as living or dead. And still, there are 225 million cubic meters of viruses on Earth. They don't seem to care what we think of them. There are even viruses that invade dead cells and reanimate them so they can be a host for them, which blurs the line even more or mitochondria. They are the power plants of most complex cells and were previously free living bacteria that entered a partnership with bigger cells. They still have their own DNA and can multiply on their own, but they are not alive anymore. They are dead. So they traded their own life for the survival of their DNA, which means living things can evolve into dead things as long as it's beneficial to their genetic code. So, maybe life is information that manages to ensure its continued existence. But what about AI, artificial intelligence? By our most common definitions, we are very close to creating artificial life in computers. It's just a question of time before the technology we build gets there. And this is not science fiction either. There are a lot of smart people actively working on this. You could already argue that computer viruses are alive. Hmm, okay, so what is life then? Things, processes, DNA, information? This got confusing very fast. One thing is for sure, 
The idea that life is fundamentally different from non-living things because they contain some non-physical element or are governed by different principles than inanimate objects turns out to be wrong. Before Charles Darwin, humans drew a line between themselves and the rest of living things. There was something magical about us that made us special. Once we had to accept we are, like every living being, a product of evolution, we drew a different line. But the more we learn about what computers can do and how life works, the closer we get to creating the first machine that fits our description of life, the more our image of ourselves is in danger again. And this will happen sooner or later. And here's another question for you. If everything in the universe is made of the same stuff, does this mean everything in the universe is dead or that everything in the universe is alive? That it's just a question of complexity? Does this mean we can never die because we were never alive in the first place? Is life and death an irrelevant question and we haven't noticed it yet? Is it possible we are much more part of the universe around us than we thought? Don't look at us, we don't have any answers for you, just questions for you to think about. After all, it's thinking about questions like this that makes us feel alive and gives us some comfort. Life is fundamentally So <laughs> that was everything that I wanted to be talking about live. I really hope that you liked the video and the topics. And finally, I really like this um, phrase about Carl, uh, given by Carl Sagan, which is the beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. <laughs> Now, Joy. Um, do we have time? Um, you guys, at some point in time, because I don't want to go over time. Um, if Auntie, are you able to put that link in? My screen isn't up. Okay, so this is just a little summary activity. It's called three, two, one. Um, let me go to. Okay, so if you, at some point, you guys um, could do this summary for us where you list three things that you learned, list two things that you already knew, and list one question that you still have. So I'm gonna put the link to it in the chat. And then let's see. Also, we have a survey. If you guys want to fill out for us and let us know how we did and how we can do better, that would be really appreciated. All right, and I think that is it for us, you guys. Thank you so much for listening to us. And it's so nice to see that you had fun today. That is actually the most important thing to achieve when we're talking about science, to have fun with science. So thank you also. Okay, goodbye. Bye, see you. Thank bye. you, bye, bye everyone. Bye. Those of you who want to join our next session today, don't forget that we have one in two hours with new topics and new lectures too. Well, <laughs> I know, Kai, it will Bye. be like midnight for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy and Anthony.
that was great. Okay, so what happened? Do we um, we meet again later today, right? So we meet today. Um, we have another session today for those of you who can come and observe and participate. Uh, that starts in two hours. Okay. Um, and then we will discuss everything with YSPs on Monday. Okay, dokie. Thank you. All right, see you in a bit. Goodbye. And please feel free to ask questions in your Slack channel. All the students have an access to ask a channel on Slack. I will be, I will make sure that I forward those questions to the instructors. Okay. Goodbye. All right, thank you.